Hey guys, this is the second video from subtopic 1.1, Properties and Uses of Materials. The focus for this lesson is going to be on nanomaterials. As we can see that we have our um, key idea and intended student learning that we'll be covering today. So firstly, nanomaterials is a branch of science that involves the use and the construction of materials on an extremely small scale. We're talking about the nanoscale and when we look at the materials themselves, we look at measuring them in extremely small units called nanometers. One nanometer is equivalent to 10 to the power of minus nine meters, which is equivalent to this number as a decimal in meters. So you can see it's extremely small. Nanomaterials generally range from about 1 to 100 nanometers in size. And we're generally talking about the size of individual atoms. So you can imagine that we are manipulating materials on a very, very small scale. This uh, image here uh, looks at uh, different scales and different magnitudes of size and looking at how we can use different units to represent um, objects that range in, in different sizes, starting from the largest on this end, which is 10 to the power of zero or one meter. So we might be looking at measuring the size of people and of adults using meters. As we move to the left, the units get smaller and smaller and become harder for us to view um, with the naked eye. So sand grains can often be measured in millimetres, even smaller than that, looking at human hair, and that's as close to what we can actually see with our naked eye. You can get to the size of uh, living objects uh, in the form of micrometres, or in, even looking at smoke particles. But because we're talking about nanomaterials, we're looking down this end here, so 10 to the minus nine meters, what we call a nanometer. And we're looking at nanomaterials like carbon nanotubes that fit in this scale here. So that would definitely be uh, invisible to the naked eye. One of the unique things about nanomaterials is that they can often exhibit properties that are quite different to larger particles of the same material. In other words, if you're looking at one material and then manipulating it so that you've got a very, very small amount on the nanoscale, both of those can often have different characteristics, or at least on the nanoscale, the properties can be further enhanced. And the primary reason is because of the difference in the surface area to volume ratio. So I just want to summarize what the surface area to volume ratio is in a diagram. What we've got are two objects here. And what we know is that both objects, object A is just one cube and object B is made up of eight smaller size cubes. But when we put them together, object B would actually take up the same amount of space as object A. That means that object A and object B have the same volume. The key difference in this case is the surface area. And I'm not going to go through it now, but if we have a look at object A, its surface area is 96 square centimeters. Whereas when we combine the surface area of the eight individual cubes in object B, that gives us a total surface area of 192 square centimeters, which happens to be double that of object A. So we can say that object B has a greater surface area so when we write this as a ratio, we can say that object B has a greater surface area to volume ratio. Another way of saying that is that object B, the uh, individual cubes, allow for a greater surface to be exposed, which then can further um, enhance some of the properties, both physical and chemical, for object B compared to object A. And it's important to note that both objects could be made up of the same material. It's just that object B, the greater surface area to volume ratio, 
might just have more pronounced uh, properties or characteristics. So we'll just have a look at a few examples of this. Um, so if we start off with graphite, and graphite is a substance commonly found in our so-called lead pencils. And if we strip away, uh, because we can look at graphite and it's made up of these individual layers and they're made up of carbon atoms joined together. If we strip one of these layers from the rest, we end up with a single layer which we can call graphene. And we are actually seeing the emergence of graphene in a lot of uh, new materials in the future because of its unique properties. Uh, one of which is looking at its extremely good uh, thermal and electrical conductivity. We see graphene even being used in uh, sports. So looking at the development of tennis rackets and tennis rackets uh, in the history have actually changed in terms of the use of materials. So now we're looking at you know, materials that can often be lighter, but still hold their strength quite well. And graphene is seen to be one of those kind of futuristic materials that we can use. It's also even being looked into uh, for the use of solar cells. And graphene, I said before, is a, a very good uh, heat and electrical conduct conductor. So we might see them being used to help make solar panels uh, lighter, to make them thinner, and to even make them more efficient at capturing light energy. Another example is looking at the use of silver nanoparticles in clothing like socks and shirts and other materials because silver has uh, good antibacterial properties uh, it perhaps isn't as good just as a, a bigger sort of macroscopic scale. So having a chunk of silver is not going to help as, as much as having these silver nanoparticles. And they can act to destroy bacteria that can result in odours forming. Uh, we can see them even being used in dressings. So to protect wounds and burns from being exposed because that can further lead to infection. Just one more final one that I'll talk about is looking at um, sunscreens. And one other common product that we'd use, uh, especially in Australia, are zinc creams. So they act to help block ultraviolet radiation, but they can often leave a, a rather white or colored residue on our skin, which some people might like, or you know, um, I think most probably don't like it. So what they've now done is looked at incorporating those zinc materials, which is zinc oxide, uh, as, a, as a nanomaterial, so in the form of zinc oxide nanoparticles. They've embedded them or they've included them in these sunscreens so that uh, they actually are now somewhat invisible. The particles are too small to actually be seen, so they actually appear colourless. Another material that we often use for similar properties and for similar purposes is titanium dioxide. Uh, using them in the form of nanoparticles allows them to be colourless, but still protect us from the sun itself. So that concludes this lesson on nanomaterials. In class, we'll go through this in a little bit more detail and possibly look at the applications of other types of nanomaterials. I'll see you guys next time. Thanks.